Well, it's our pleasure to be here. Here over the side. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about education, uh, some of the history of education, and then uh, maybe some active things we can do now to make a difference. But as we look at the history of education, I, I want to point out that in early education, there are some basic foundational philosophies that we have seemed to have discarded over more recent decades. And I'm going to point out three things. Now, we can talk about more than three things in early American education, but if you look back anywhere in early American history, these are three things you will consistently find throughout the history in early America. Uh, the first thing is to teach religion, morality, and knowledge. That was why we started school. The second thing, it's very clear in every school, every state, was to teach thinking skills. We'll talk about how that's a little different than some of what we do today. And the third thing is to instill high expectations. And this is also a little different where if you talk to a teacher today, every teacher's going to say, well, I, I, I believe the best for my students. Well, that's true. But we've forgotten what we used to be able to achieve in earlier generations. And, and I want to walk us through and show us some perspective of where we've come from, of where things have changed a little bit. And, and then we'll talk about even how we can restore some of those things. So I'm going to start with the first one, to teach religion, morality, and knowledge. This was a universal thought. When you look at early America, the, er the earliest settlers, pilgrims coming to America, we can certainly talk about, uh, you can go back to the Roanoke Colony in Jamestown, sure. The Pilgrims are one of the main legacies as we think about American history. And really, they represent so much of what America was. There were so many settlers coming to America looking for religious freedom, coming to the New World. And this became very much part of what New England was all about, these settlers seeking religious freedom. And, and New England was growing so much that by 1647, there was a need to in kind of uh, instill a, a depth of education. They said, we need to start schools. And when they started schools, we actually have a book, it's called The Code of the 1650s. And it has the very first laws that were passed in the New England states of America. In 1647 is when they passed this education law. And if you go through the book, you'll find the education law was known as the Old Deluder Satan Act. And the reason is when you find this <laughs> section. Now, let's also point out, in the 1600s, there was no such thing as standardized spelling, which means you could not misspell a word. Some of us would have had a better GPA, right, if we could go back. This is the very first education law passed in America, and here's what it says. It being the one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of scriptures as in former times, keeping them in an unknown tongue and all it goes. The starting premise of why we needed education, why we needed schools in America, is because the devil's main objective is to keep people from knowing the word of God. And if our kids can't read, they're never going to be able to read the Bible, and they won't know what the Bible says, and then they won't know how God's called us to live and what God expects of us in our life. We need to make sure our kids can read so they would know the Bible. Well, to illustrate this even further, the very first textbook printed in English in America was printed in 1690. It was a new primer, or a primer. And as you go through this, we, we have dozens of this. And, and these were used in public schools from 1690 all the way up to the early 1900s. So for hundreds of years at Wall Builders, we have dozens of these early primers. What's super fun is as you start to go through them, of course they're going to show you the alphabet, and, and you learn the alphabet along the way. But after you've gone through the alphabet, it shows you the, the capital letters, and, and you learn your consonants and your vowels. It then has what's known as a picture alphabet. You see a picture of a man and a woman, that there's a fruit tree, a snake around it, and it says, in Adam's fall, we send all. And I know it looks like we fend all. That's old English. There was a hard and a soft S. But, but that's clearly a Bible idea. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. That's a picture of a man holding a Bible in his hand. He's looking up to heaven. C, Christ crucified for sinners die. That's a three magi. That's a stable. It's a star by the stable across on a hill. The entire thing was profoundly Christian and religious. Now, again, this is just the alphabet. Why in the world are you telling so many Bible thoughts or stories for the alphabet? Because the point of education wasn't just for kids to learn the alphabet or learn to read or write. It was to learn the foundation of truth, which was found in the Bible. As you keep going, you come to a place like H, which says, my book and heart must never part. That's a picture of a heart with a Bible inside of it, which if you're familiar with Psalm 119, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's exactly the image they were showing. Look, it's even better. At the end of this alphabet, the very next section was a, a section of lessons for youth, and then it followed up with an alphabet of lessons for youth. This is the next alphabet illustrated. A, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble the rest. C, come unto Christ, all ye that labor, are heavy laden, heal ye rest. That's Bible verses. 
This is literally the entire New England primer. It's just Bible after Bible. Now, sure, we're teaching kids the alphabet, but we're teaching them what we really thought education was about. It was a foundation in the principles of the Word of God, a knowledge of the Word of God. And to go even further, at the end of every single New England primer, they included Stansbury's Shorter Catechism, which is more than 100 questions on faith and theology. And this was, this was used as a first grade textbook in early America. And, and, and even saying first grade is a little misleading. It was a first level textbook because no matter how old you were, this is where you started. If you were four, if you were seven, if you were 16, this is where you started. But, but generally, we would know this is first grade. Well, if you think of first grade, five, six, seven year olds, let me show you some of the questions that students were required to know when they studied this. At the end of this, this is part of the question on faith and theology. Look at question number 36. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? That, that's Bible college, right? Like, I, I'm thinking first grade, dog, cat, not sanctification. This is crazy. This is literally where education started in America. And, and, and by the way, this is something that we've actually reprinted the one from 1777. Uh, many founding fathers had a part in printing this one in their states in 1777, so it's available at wallblers.com. But this was part of the foundation of education. You keep going, you can go to the very first Congress when, when they're going to add the expansion of new territories coming in, and we're going to add new states. Well, this is where they come up with the idea of the Northwest Territory. In the, or excuse me, Northwest Ordinance, part of that territory, but in the Northwest Ordinance, which George Washington signed into law, Part of what was signed into law, it says, and this was part of Article 3, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools, and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Now, we're going to encourage schools. Why? Because of what schools produce. What do schools produce? Religion, morality, and knowledge. It's interesting, today we've come to the place that we think, well, schools should, they should be morality. What? You will hear from every teacher who's honest with you is the biggest challenges that we deal with in schools today are classroom discipline. Why? Because we have immoral kids. Guess why we have immoral kids? Because we haven't given them a foundation of truth found in the Word of God. See, there's, there's a sequence to this. They understood that we've seen to grab today. Religion helps you understand morality, and once you're moral, then you can learn all of the math equations you need to know, right? You learn your multiplication table. But this is part of literally every single state that gets added to the union going forward. This is the standard that was used for states going forward for education. And I'll go even a little bit further. If you go to 1816 in New Jersey schools, this is the report coming from New Jersey schools about what kids were learning in their school. This is the state report. All the scholars of the first and second classes, now first and second classes meaning first and second grade, commit to memory portions of the New Testament or Psalms a lesson in the catechism, several hymns, and the text of the preceding Sabbath. The text of the preceding Sabbath in towns back then, right? There's generally one church. So whatever the pastor taught on, the kids are going to memorize those verses that next week in school. This is part of education. It doesn't even stop there. One of the scholars, now first and second grade, remember, one of the scholars has committed to memory the book of John and the first 30 Psalms together with the 119th Psalm. The majority have committed to memory the Gospel of John. I, I don't know a pastor, largely speaking, that can memorize this. Like, this is crazy. 1816, this is a report from that district to the state of what their students were accomplishing. This is first and second grade. Now, that, that was 1816. Let's let's jump. Oh, by the way, it continues on in the third and fourth classes, because now we're getting to the smart kids, right? One of the scholars of the classes has committed to memory the Westminster Larger Catechism to the Commandments, Christ's Sermon on the Mount, and 10 chapters in John. If we go to Pennsylvania, 1892, this is a report from Pennsylvania to the state. They explained, let the selection for the week be, now this was their standards. But the selection of the week be, if possible, two in number, the first from the Bible or sacred song, and the second from the world of literature, prose or verse. Say the 19th Psalm in Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg, the lead kind of light, and Longfellow's Psalm of Light, meaning every week they're going to memorize two things, a passage from the Bible, and then something of significance in the literary world. They continue on. 
or the 23rd Psalm and Lowell's Once to Every Man or Nation, or the 19th Psalm and the Home Sweet Home, or My Country Tis of Thee, or the Chamber of Nautilus, or the 13th chapter of Corinthians and the Last Rose of Summer, or any others of hundreds of good things, moral, religious, uh, patriotic, descriptive, or sentimental, in the best sense of the word, that we should all be very glad to have securely lodged in the memory and let the teacher always commit to memory what is here required of the people. Amen. <laughs> it's a different education standard, even for teachers. Okay, but let me point out, th this is part of when you look at early America, the foundation always was religion, morality, knowledge. It wasn't until the 1960s, the case Engel versus Vital, where the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know, we really shouldn't have prayer every day in the classroom. The following year, 1963, there was a Google decision, Abington Ship and Murray Curlever, the Supreme Court said, yeah, we, we really shouldn't have Bible reading every day in schools either. And what's super interesting about this, you can actually go look up a Supreme Court decision where they said no more Bible in schools. And if you read that decision, shockingly, one of the things the Supreme Court did is they quoted a psychologist as part of the reason the Bible had to be removed from schools. This is part of their Supreme Court decision of removing the Bible. Here's what they said. If portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could have been and had been psychologically harmful to the child. If a kid were to read the New Testament and a pastor doesn't explain it, it might cause a kid brain damage. I've read the New Testament a lot. And if we think practically we're worried about something terrifying kids. I would argue, what's the most graphic thing that happens in the New Testament? It's the crucifixion of the Savior of the world. Now, what's interesting is the Supreme Court said two things. They said Jesus, but secondly, they said in Revelation, it talks about eternal damnation, and we wouldn't want kids to be terrified of hell. I would. I think that'd solve a lot of our behavioral problems, right? Yes. Don't do that. Hell's a bad place. Nonetheless, this is part of what laid the foundation where now this notion of teaching religion, morality, and knowledge, this is a major hurdle over the last many decades in education. But let me back up again. Well, one of the other things that was very clear in early education was to teach thinking skills. Now, this is a little different for us today, but, but let me give you let me give you a Bible thought, and then I'm going to show you this in early education. If you look at the Bible, Proverbs 22, 6, it tells us, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Now, that's something that maybe some of us have heard before. It's worth asking the question, though. It says train up. How are you supposed to train them? Because there's more than one method of training, right? Anybody who's done any kind of training on any level, whatever sport, whatever activity, right, whatever competitive circuit there is, there's different ways of training. What do we mean by train? Well, I think it's interesting that in some Bibles there is commentary, and actually in some of the Bible commentaries. So this is Proverbs 22, 6. And if you see where there's train of a child, you see there's a little circle there. If you actually go beside it, the word it's used is catechize. Now, catechize is a specific kind of training. So what does that actually mean? Well, if we go back to the verse that you're supposed to train up a child and let you go, well, well, more accurately, you might say, to catechize a child in the way they should go. Now, what is a catechism? A catechism is the method by which we did all early education. If you look at any early textbook, notice a catechism of ancient history, a catechism of agricultural chemistry and geology, a catechism on American law, a catechism on entomology, questions and answers. Now, the catechism is simply questions and answers. It's asking questions that you have to think through and give the answer. That's what this is, a catechism of astronomy. Uh, as we continue on, a catechism of music, a catechism of electricity, super interesting in my mind, a catechism or a geographical catechism, a catechism of mineralogy. The point is, a catechism was the way we used to do things. And actually, this is one of my favorite, an elementary catechism on the Constitution of the United States. Yes. <laughs> How great would it be if we had our students, maybe even elementary students, going back and learning the foundation of the Constitution? We would recognize the Bill of Rights being violated because we actually know what the Bill of Rights was about. This was elementary school, right? This was the very beginning. And what is a catechism? A catechism is simply asking the question, right? To catechize means, okay, well, who said this? What did they say? When did they say it? Where did they say it? Why did they say it? How did they say it? If you can answer all of those questions, you will have a much better grasp of the answer. And that was the point. We catechize students to make them think through 
so they could give an answer based on whatever the question was. And what's really kind of significant is when you see the change happen, when the progressives took over in the early 1920s, you had people like Rockefeller who said, we don't need to produce thinkers, we need better factory workers. He said, we need to change, and, and, and Rockefeller, right, putting in millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in today's value into education, they said, we need to change things. Well, what did they change? If you look at what they started doing, they said, well, thinking is not really as much the priority. We, we need people that will take orders better, that will do what they're told, work in the factory. And so along those lines, as progressives take over, they say, well, thinking is not the priority. We, we want them to learn, which really means we want them to regurgitate what we want them to memorize. This is where you see the introduction of new techniques in education, such as for the very first time, we did things like fill in the blank, or we did true, false, or even multiple choice. Before the 1920s, every single thing was either an essay or it was some kind of equation that you had to work out. This is where, right, in this standard, fill in the blank, all you have to know is what's missing from what the teacher told me. There's no thinking, it's memorizing and regurgitating. We, we probably can pay attention that most of our students don't have critical thinking skills and abilities, which is why so many college students are in favor of socialism. It's because you don't know how to critically think, because if you could, you'd recognize this has never worked anywhere in the history of the world, right? Like, this is not complicated, but this is part of the change of what happened. And by the way, I was involved in education. I was a high school teacher for a lot of years, and it's super way more convenient to grade multiple choice than to grade essays. I get my teachers to support this. It's just it's not producing what we think it is or what we want it to. Unless you're a progressive and this is what you want. It's people that just do whatever they're told and take orders and don't think for themselves. But this is part of where we look at society. How have we become like the most gullible people ever? Well, the government said, right? We get political for a second. Well, well Fauci said. You understand how crazy it was over the last couple years when we were told well, we're not supposed to question the science. Does nobody remember science? The very nature of science is you question the science. That's the whole point. This is the problem, is we no longer are promoting the same kind of thinking skills. We are promoting repeating what we are told. In fact, one of the things that would be common for teachers today is hey, everybody be quiet, write this down, it's gonna be on the test. Write what down? Meaning you only have to listen and repeat what I tell you. Don't think for yourself, don't problem solve, just do what you're told and repeat it. That, that's not producing what needs to be done and, and really not helping a rising generation learn to be free. Let me give you the last thought, is instill high expectations. And everybody today says, oh, we believe the best. I get it, we, we do. I was, again, I was a high school teacher for six years, Believe the best, expected the most from my students, but our friend Rabbi Lappin pointed out something that is very interesting. He said, first of all, Tim, it's important to know when God first spoke, God could have chosen any language he wanted. God spoke in Hebrew. Now, the reason this matters is because in Hebrew, everything has value, meaning, and significance. Nothing is insignificant. He said, it's also important to know that just as much as what you can say is important, there are things you cannot say in Hebrew, and that's equally important because that means they never came out of the mouth of God, which means they're not really from God. Okay, well then that's an easy time to go, okay, well what are those things that God never said that maybe aren't God's idea? So this is us right, in, investigating with our rabbi. He said, well, if you just say through, he said, first of all, the word coincidence, that, that's a word that is, is not sayable in the Hebrew language. Why? Because it never occurred to God something was coincidence. Right? God didn't make Adam, and he's like, you found Eve, what a coincidence. <laughs> no, he did that. Right? There is no coincidence in God's kingdom. Well, the idea of retirement, not to upset anybody here, but let's just point out. There's only one example in scripture of somebody saying, I'm going to store up as much wealth as I can, and then I'm going to do nothing and enjoy my wealth. That guy died and lost everything. It doesn't mean you can't change a job description. Maybe you want to be a missionary on the golf course for the next 30 years. Good for you. Right? That's great. But as long as we are here, God expects us to be useful and productive. God has us here on purpose and for a reason. We don't retire when we do nothing and become unproductive. Or the idea of fair. Well, that's not fair. Think about the Bible. Is it fair what happened to Job? Is it, is it fair what happened to Joseph? His brothers sold him into slavery? Like, you start thinking there's not fair. 
But what you see from Scripture is God seems to place more weight on how you respond to what happens to you than on what happens to you. Because life ain't fair. It wasn't fair for Jesus. He did nothing wrong, ever. But this is not part of the Bible. Justice is, but justice is a legal idea, not a subjective fair. That's not fair. We're going to keep going. The idea of rights. In Hebrew, it's responsibility. We'd say, no, no, I have the right of religious expression, the right of speech. Well, Rabbi Lappin said, really, the best way to understand that is, is you have a responsibility to speak truthfully. You have a responsibility to worship the one God. It's, it's more of a responsibility than the way we think of a right. Now, it's a God-given right, but there's a responsibility that corresponds with every right. But here's the one I want to point out. He said there is no such word as adolescence in the Hebrew language. That's interesting. Because if you think of it, I mean, generally, think about it. In the Hebrew culture, 13, you have your bar mitzvah, you became a man. If, if you think of the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, When I was a child, I thought of a reason to act like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You go from a child to a man. Well, in America, we've embraced this idea of adolescence, right? Ah, oh, it's just kids being kids. He's only 18. He's only 22, right? I mean, you think we're kidding, right? This is the reality. Oh, Hunter's only... 60 years old, Mr. Hunter Biden, he doesn't know. He can't help it. I mean, this is how crazy we are. If you look at America, this idea of the age of adolescence, it used to be, it used to be growing up, right? Well, okay, that's 18 years old, right? Because 18, you, you get your license and and, and and you can, well, maybe drink, maybe not. 21 became a thing, right? But but you had some uh, opportunity, uh, power, ability. Well, then it was 21, right? Because, well, that's when you can drink and you can really be, but here's the reality. In the modern era, we have now extended it, not just 18, not just 21, it's now called prolonged adolescence. Under President Obama, his White House came out and said, we now know, this happened in 2014, they said, we now know that prolonged adolescence extends all the way to 35 years old. <laughs> what they said is, we know that to be the case because it takes people until they're about 35 before they live on their own, in their own place, they have a steady job, and they're in a steady relationship. The problem is we're using behavior to define the standard. I mean, I, I remember growing up when I was told, grow up and be a man, right? Or the belt's waiting on you. Like, th this is not the way it used to be, but this is the way it is in a modern era culture. And if you back up this notion of high expectations, if you look at early America, what did we expect of students back then? If you go back to the early textbooks, for example, an elementary spelling book. Now, again, let me highlight this is elementary. Okay? Elementary, this is this is third and fourth grade. If you look at some of the words for third and fourth graders, I literally have gotten out of dictionary to try to learn these words so that when I teach people history, they be like, well, here's what this word means. I don't even know how to pronounce some of these words. This was for children. And, and if we go a little further, we can look at something like geography in, in our early America. This is a geography quiz, and this was fourth grade. Chicago, 1862. Notice fourth grade, some of the questions. How many degrees of longitude are there? How many degrees wide are the temperate zones? Name the principal animals of the frigid zone. What portion of people on the globe are pagan, and what portion are Christian? Now, that bottom one I can point out, that changes a lot. But the fact that we were even highlighting for kids that there are pagans and there are Christians, like that is even significant. This is fourth grade. And I was a math person. So if we look at the math, I love the math side. It's crazy what they were doing in elementary school. If you look at some of the math that was done, this is about a sixth grade level. So this is math. I insured two thirds of a shop worth 3,600, a fourth fifth of a house worth $6,000, paying $126. What was the rate of insurance? That's a sixth grade math question. Or we can point out something like this. How many $50 shares at 8% discount must be given for 23 bonds, $100 each at 2% premium? That's sixth grade. The reason I point this out is so often today, we look at modern education, we're like, man, we have really high standards compared to what? Right? But, but this is where we've seen challenges. Now, let me point out. This is part of the foundation that made America so unique and strong and relevant for so long. The most free, stable, prosperous nation in the history of the world. So when you remove the foundation, what's going to happen? And this is where we want to point out, obviously, a lot of problems, but there's a lot of things that can be done to turn this around. So what do we do to turn it around? There's some specific things we want to point to tonight. 
and, and looking at things, you turn around specifically, let me go back to Northrop's story, because remember it said religion, morality, and knowledge. That was the standard for all of education, all of the United States. That's the standard we had, we enforced that. There's actually a Supreme Court case in 1844 called Vidal versus Gerard's Executors. It came out of Philadelphia where a government-run, government-operated school said, um, we don't think we're gonna do the Bible schools anymore. And an 8-0 unanimous Supreme Court decision, the court said, no, no, if you're a government-run, government-operated school, you will teach the Bible in schools. We're not gonna have a government school, we're gonna teach the Bible. So this is what the history was. We don't get history anymore today. We kind of opt that out to rewrite it. And so what happened was when progressives got involved, particularly Tim mentioned in the 1920s, they got into everything. Progressives got into government, they got into higher education, they got into media, they got into all education, and pretty soon they got into the courts as well. And we see progressives take the courts in 1947 through 1957 kind of range. And when they took the courts, that's when they said, you know, this thing about having prayer in schools, we've done that for 160 years, we've done it, but we're not gonna do it anymore. It's time to progress past that. It's time to progress past the Constitution. So they took prayer out of schools in the same way. Uh, the next year they said, you know, it's time to progress past the Bible. The very first public school law in America is 1647 to teach students to read the Bible. It's the first public school law, so we've had that for 300 years, but it's time to do something different. And so what happens is we progress past that. When you look at what the court did, they redefined the First Amendment. Now the First Amendment has two clauses. It has the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. The Establishment Clause is what affects the government entities. This is what the individual is. And so they redefined both clauses. In 1971, in a case called uh, called Lemon versus Kirkman, they said, you know, here's the new standard for what's constitutional for government. If the government wants to do a religious activity, here's a three-pronged test. The number one problem was, if government wants to do something religious, the number one purpose of that religious activity has to be secular. By definition, you'll never win that case, and we didn't win cases. We lost 7,300 cases on the Lemon test because you can't show that the primary purpose of having prayer at a football game is secular. You can have a devotional from, I don't know, the newspaper, read an editorial or something. But this is where we started losing everything. And they did the same thing with the free exercise clause. Uh, they came out with this employment division organ, and it says, we'll tell you what your religious exercise is. We'll tell you when your religion is compelling you. We'll tell you if your religion really needs an exemption for COVID, military guys, et cetera. So this is what we've been operating under for the last 50, 60 years. Now, what's happened with these, we lose all sorts of stuff. We started about four years ago getting different justices on the Supreme Court, and they actually read the Constitution. It was a refreshing thing to have someone to pledge to uphold something. But it, with progressives, the Constitution is whatever their opinions are. So when you talk about upholding the Constitution, every congressman takes an oath to do that. They don't all do it because they have two definitions of what a Constitution is. One is it's the body of opinions that the court has issued. The other is it's what is written down. So these guys looked at that. A case came to them four years ago, 2019, Bladesburg Cross case. This is a, a cross in Maryland. It was a World War I memorial. About 20 some odd guys were killed in World War I. The moms raised this cross. And this was challenged because, wait a minute, this is government. You can't have a cross. There's not a secular purpose to having that. And so the court looked at it and said, you know, and we live in Kersman under that standard. We have to carry that down because the primary purpose of that cross is not secular. They could have done an orb. They could have done a pyramid. They could have done any other shape. If they put a cross up there, that's not a secular purpose. That's a religious purpose. But they said, we don't want to carry that cross down. That's wrong. We've had crosses since the beginning of time with the military. We've had crosses in the military cemeteries across the United States. We don't think we should tear that down. And so what the court did was they upheld the Bladesburg Cross decision. And they came up with a new test. They said, look, the Lemon Test is really, really flawed. It should never have been used. It's not based on the Constitution. It's based on what the rest of the courts did. So here's the new standard, and they gave it to us here. Let me just show it to you a little bigger. They said the new standard is that a long-standing, religiously expressive monument, symbol, and practices require a strong presumption of constitutionality. In other words, if this is a religious activity that's been going in America for a long time, we're going to assume that it's constitutional just by the fact that it's been here for a long time. So what happened with this when the Bladesburg decision shifted the presumption. Instead of now saying religion in schools, we're going to assume that's unconstitutional, they're saying religion in schools, we're now going to assume that it's constitutional. Because we've got it back since 1647 with the first public school law. We've got it with the first federal law, 1789, the Northwest Story. We're going to assume it's constitutional. So what happened at that point in time, it starts a ripple effect. Things start moving outward. Now, the decisions that were won, this is why they came to the court last year. First Liberty here in Dallas had this. Uh, Coach Kennedy, wanted, he was praying at football games, praying by himself, praying silently. 
And the court said, I'm going to limit, and this is the case, but the court said under the limit decision, we can't let him do that because there's not a secular reason for him going out and praying after a football game. But they said, but he ought to be able to pray. So the court said, we're getting rid of the limit test. This is it. No longer will the court use the limit test at all. This is completely gone. And at that point in time, the court announced that 7,300 previous cases have been made were wrong, that they're all out the door. So what's happening now? So what's happening now is what we do. Well, First Liberty, who actually argued that case, they, they gave us an offensive-minded strategy. And if you look at the Bible, Proverbs 22, 20, 21, 22, it says, The wise man attacks the city of the stronghold, and tear, the city of the mighty tears down the stronghold. This concept of attacking the stronghold. Or, if you remember Princess Bride, have fun storming the castle. That's essentially what you want to do. You want to go on the offensive, because we now have tools in our arsenal we haven't had in a long time. It will be offensive-minded. Most administrators are not going to be part of this. They don't know what happened to the Supreme Court. They're not legal experts. It doesn't matter. We have to go on the offense and help them understand what's out there. So in doing that, First Liberty came out and said, look, the kind of categories that were in that limit decision that we can now start doing would include things like the Ten Commandments. We can put the Ten Commandments up. We already have it a lot of, a lot of um, capitals. But now start putting it up at, outside city halls. Put it up in wherever. As a matter of fact, we've got a bill in Texas this year that says we're going to post the Ten Commandments in every classroom in the state of Texas. So that's, 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 if you think that bill is not going to be bought in the crazy, the other side is not about to let this happen because they've had it their way for 60 years. But boy, wouldn't it be really bad if people were to do things like don't steal and don't kill and don't perjure yourself? We can't have that going on. See, this is the kind of stuff we need to start doing. In the same way, the same thing happens with moral crosses. We've been taking crosses down for a long time. It's now time to start putting the moral crosses back up because that's something that now is gone with the limit test. Same with public invocations, whether it's at legislatures or whether it's at city councils or, or whether it's at school boards. Start praying in public bodies. Open those public bodies with prayer. That's what we did for centuries. And now it's time to start doing that again. Same thing when you get to nativity scenes and crosses. We started having to take nativity scenes out because they said, you know, that looks religious. We need Santa Claus in there. We need Rick Rudolph. We need not anymore. You can now start putting up nativity scenes just because they are nativity scenes. And by the way, all the church music, all the, the church, uh, excuse me, all the school choirs we've had, they had to stop singing carols. They had to sing Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer or Jingle. We can now go back to singing the traditional Christmas carols that go with Christmas. And schools can do that. It's absolutely funny because that was limit test. Same thing when you get in God we trust displays. It doesn't matter whether it's in school buildings or whether it's in, in, in city halls. It doesn't matter if it's in classrooms. This is Arkansas. Every single classroom in Arkansas has to display this on the wall in, in classrooms in Arkansas. Uh, whether it's in, in the gym, wherever it is. Go back to putting up the national motto, in God we do trust. Student-led prayer, as long as students are leading prayer, it's absolutely fine to have prayer in schools. Students can lead that, lots of ways of doing that. Uh, as a matter of fact, go back to graduation prayer. We haven't had that in 15 years because the court said no. That's now back on the table because the limited case is gone. We need people who will be aggressive in pushing these things because now we can win the cases. And that's where First Liberty is loving these kind of cases. Uh, final kind of things, I'll point out two more. Bible courses for credit. You can't teach the Bible in schools right now. 1,200 school districts in America teach the Bible in schools as Bible, as literature. As a matter of fact, I just got a call from a school district up in Minnesota. Uh, they've created a whole class, a, a, a class of schools, a credit class, and it's the influence of the Bible and the American family. And that's what the course is all about. So you can teach the Bible, not as doctrine, but you can teach as history, as literature, the impact it had on political thinking, political science, due process, anything else. Uh, final category is balanced science treatment. The reason we couldn't teach creation anymore was the limit test. You can't do that. Limit test not there anymore. We can now go back to teaching things we haven't been able to teach in 50 years. So progressives took all this stuff out. We have an opportunity to put it back in. And so what we have to do is we do have to be offensive minded. These are all <coughs> legal groups. If you want to do some of these and, and whatever you're involved with, check with these legal groups. They'd love to defend. Hopefully somebody will sue you if you do this. Because that's what we need. Because if they will sue you, then these guys will take it to court. We can win that. And the whole nation wins as a result. So we have to start pushing back. <laughs> We all can't find it, but it doesn't matter whether you're on school boards or city council, it doesn't matter what board you're elected to, be offensive minded with all this stuff, go after it. We can make a difference if we'll get aggressive. God bless you guys.